paleo.com and I'm here to show you my batch cooking routine live in my kitchen today. Um, I'm going to get right started um, with some bone broth and um, I don't know if you guys have seen, I have a post on my site about how I make bone broth in a pressure cooker and so that's what I'm going to start with today. So I'm going to grab my bones. A lot of people are confused about what kind of bones they need to use when making bone broth. Um, knuckle bones are always a really good bone to start with. They have a lot of uh, connective tissue and minerals and stuff in the joints. So I'm going to start by adding some knuckle bones to my broth. These are the, my frozen beef knuckle bones. And then also, I always add in a bunch of bones that I have um, from eating maybe like bone-in meat last night. We had pork chops, so I'm going to grab those bones and add them in too. It's totally fine to add a bunch of different types of bones. You don't need to only use all chicken or all beef. I always throw in what I've got. Actually, um, so the trick to getting bone broth that gels that I know of is to actually put as many bones as you possibly can in your pot um, in the least amount of water. So that means that your broth is going to come out more concentrated. So here I've got about half of my pot filled with bones and there's still some room. So I'm going to dump out a little water and I'm going to add some... Um, some bones from my freezer bag, and this is just how I collect bones when I roast a chicken or eat bone and meat. I just throw it in this bag in the freezer. And then actually after I make bone broth, I keep all of the intact bones and I put them back in the freezer. So I reuse them until they completely break apart. So I'm going to add some of these bones to my broth here. So with a pressure cooker, you're, if you're using a pressure cooker, it'll come with a fill line. You want to fill it to the maximum amount that your instructions say. My pressure cooker has a little line on the inside that says two-thirds, and that's as full as they want it to go. So don't go over your fill line. So I'm going to dump out just a little bit of my water here. Um, and I've got this pot completely packed with as many bones as it, um, as it will take up to the fill line. And then I've put filtered water in there. And then I'm going to add um, a little bit of apple cider vinegar. This helps take some of the minerals out of the bones, which is what we want when we're cooking it. Um, so I'm just going to put like a splash. And I'm going to add a bay leaf, which helps with the flavor. I'm not going to add salt because I like to use bone broth in recipes. And a lot of recipes call for salt. So if you salt your broth, you might end up with a recipe that gets over-salted. So I like to not salt my broth, especially since some of the bones, like I used the chicken carcass here that I had roasted previously, and that had a lot of salt on it. So you don't want to end up with way too much salt in your broth. Um, I like to taste the dish when, I get, when it comes time to cook with it. And my stove, so pressure cookers are super efficient, and this is a Coomer Con, and it's so efficient that I actually, I don't have a flame tamer, but I just take one of the grates off of my stove, because um, the lowest flame will keep this on the highest pressure, so um, you might have to do some sort of rigging um, to get yours to, to work. And then I'm going to put this on the stove, and I'm going to bring it up to the highest pressure, and I'm going to cook it this way for three hours. So we're not going to get to see the whole bone broth process today, um, but this is how it starts. And then I'll usually do this in an afternoon, 
and uh, I'll cook it for three hours. I'll let it depressurize naturally. If you're running out of time, there's a way, depending on the type of pressure cooker you have, mine I can put it under cold water in the sink and it'll depressurize really quickly. And then I will strain all the bones out. I'll keep all of the ones that are still intact. I'll put them back in the freezer for the next batch of broth. And then I'll portion out all of my broth into these mason jars, which I'll show you. I've got some in the fridge from last time. So I store them just in like old jars. Um, I haven't had a lot of luck storing these in the freezer. They tend to break. So um, I actually don't store mine in the freezer for that reason. I try to make a batch fresh every week and then use it up. Um, that's another thing you should know about broths. If you're worried about the fat, which I don't think you should be worried about it, but sometimes if you use a lot of fresh bones, you'll end up with like an inch or two of fat on the top. Um, you can scoop that off and use that as solid cooking fat and other recipes. Um, sometimes if you, if you heat the broth up and it has too much fat on top, it'll make you nauseous. So um, I'm not fat phobic or anything, but I know a lot, I get a lot of questions about fat. It definitely varies broth batch to batch depending on the source of the bones, what kind of bones you're using. Um, so while the broth is cooking, I'm going to start with um, roasted root vegetables. And they're an awesome uh, addition to have while uh, I like to make a really big batch during the week and then add them in for my breakfasts and for different meals. So we're going to prep up a really simple mix. I have this recipe on my site that's called Rainbow Roasted Root Vegetables. So I've already washed these guys. I don't usually peel my organic vegetables with beets. I'll just kind of trim around like the gnarly, hairy parts, but um, as long as they're organic, the peel actually has a lot of nutrients in it, so I'm not going to worry about peeling them today. And I'm just going to chop them into really big chunks. And feel free to use the Q&A function if you guys have any questions about batch cooking or if I haven't explained something enough. I'm going to try to keep rolling um, as I'm talking so that you can see me cook a lot of different things. And my husband is actually here. I didn't introduce him, but Noah, you want to say hi? Introduce yourself. He's um, kind of manning the computer over Hello. there. <laughs> yeah. He's helping me find questions to answer and stuff. So if you guys have questions, feel free to ask away. So I've put in a, a gold beet here, um, a parsnip or two. And I like to cook them up in really big chunks. So to you guys how you how you do it. Got the turnip. And then I've got a red beet, beautiful, delicious red beet. And you can see behind me the pressure cooker is kind of making some noise as it comes to pressure. I put it on a high flame until it gets up to high, its fullest pressure, which um, depending on what kind of pressure cooker you have, it'll kind of pop up here and there's one little red bar for um, low pressure and then there's two red bars for high pressure. So I'm going to keep it on high until it, until it comes to full pressure. It might make a little noise as it gets there. Mickey, you have a question about the fat from the bone broth. Yeah. It says, uh, can I just use the fat from bone broth, or do I have to render fat first? Um, you can use fat from bone broth in order to cook. It's actually, um, you know, depending on what you, what animal, what bones you use. I would say if, if you're doing, like, chicken, a lot of chicken bones, um, the, chick, the fat from chicken has more omega-6 than omega-3 fats. And it, the, the ratio isn't as good as, like, beef. So um, I wouldn't use it, like, exclusively. It still has been exposed to high temperatures for a long amount of time, but I think it's a perfectly good cooking fat. Um, I really like rendering lard. That's my favorite fat to render. And um, actually, if you, get, if you cook a duck, duck fat is really fun, too. But, yeah, it's totally acceptable to cook with the fat that you use off the top of the bone broth. 
Um, personally, I don't use it as my main cooking fat. I use it as like something I have around when, um, especially when I cook something that's um, really flavorful. So like Thanksgiving turkey, you know, that, that fat that comes off that broth is going to taste really good. So I like to save that. Um, what was I doing? Oh yeah, so I'm making these um, rainbow roasted root vegetables. And so I've chopped them all up here really roughly. And you can kind of see. Um, and it's page 188 in the book, if you guys have it. Um, and I'm just going to pour some coconut oil, which my stove is really inefficient, and so it gets really hot when it cooks, which um, is really nice for melting coconut oil down. So I'm pouring um, some coconut oil on there, and I'm going to let that move up here later. And then I've already preheated my oven to 400 degrees. Um, it's nice and hot. I like the caramelization that I get from the root vegetables when I cook at that temperature. And you can put any manner of root vegetables in here. You can add sweet potatoes. Um, I've got beets, carrots, turnip. Um, I've got two different kinds of colored beets, parsnips. Um, you could add celeriac. Kind of anything goes. So I'm going to throw these in the oven. So we've got bone broth started, root vegetables in the oven, and now I'm going to start uh, prepping uh, breakfast patties. So let me get the meat out for that. Today I've got ground beef, and we're going to make the three herb breakfast patties from my cookbook. Um, you could use any type of ground meat to make breakfast patties. I love to switch it up and use pork. Um, you could even mix, so like pork and beef mix together are really good. I really like chicken patties, lamb. Lately I've been using a lot of bison, um, so you don't need to only make them with beef. So I'm going to open these up. You've got another question about cooking fats. Yeah. Um, you have a question. Do you always use coconut oil when you roast your veggies? I don't always use coconut oil. You know, um, duck fat is the best tasting fat, I think, for, for veggies. But you can use any solid cooking fat. So you can use lard. Um, you can use tallow, which is, comes from beef. Um, you can use any kind of solid fat. I like having coconut oil around. Um, I like the flavor. Some people don't. Um, so yeah, you can use whatever, whatever you like and whatever you tolerate. And some people on the autoimmune protocol, the first dairy that they're able to tolerate is actually ghee. So if you tolerate ghee, um, I would caution anyone that wants to reintroduce it too soon. I actually don't tolerate ghee, and so a lot of people, a lot of proponents of ghee like to say that it's like the most tolerable dairy. Even people that are super allergic to dairy can tolerate it. I'm one of the weird ones that doesn't, so just be careful. Um, and now I'm just going to chop up some herbs. So I've got two pounds of ground beef. Um, That'll make about uh, 10 to 12 patties. So for one person, that'll get you easily through a couple weeks, maybe, um, of breakfast. And I'm going to add some fresh herbs. So I've got rosemary here. And then I'm going to do, I'm going to skip the thyme because it's going to take me a little while. But I usually do rosemary, thyme, and sage. I like those three herbs together. And I think my recipe calls for about three tablespoons of fresh herbs, which is a lot. But I think it really makes the sausage patties taste really flavorful. So I'm going to chop all these guys up. And for every two pounds of meat, I like to use half a teaspoon of salt. So you could make these with any combination of herbs and meats that you like. And I actually like having more than one variety on hand at a time. I mean, it keeps things different. You know, so if you're eating them for breakfast every day, you're not eating the same thing for breakfast every single day.
Um, so I'm going to add these chapters, which you can see it's kind of a lot, um, but I love my pressures. Throw that in the bowl with two pounds of beef. And I'm going to get half a teaspoon of sea salt. And then I'm going to get my pan ready. Here. And then I'm going to form patties out of these guys. So while I'm doing this, do you guys have any questions about batch cooking? Making meat patties, bone broth. What? Okay. So I'm going to tell you why I think batch cooking is really important. When I was really sick, I actually had lots of time to cook. That wasn't my issue because I lost my job because I was so sick. Um, and I started batch cooking because I didn't really have the energy to be cooking a meal every single time I needed to eat. So I started making broth. I had a day where I would kind of save up my energy and then spend a few hours at a time. And then when I started feeling better and I, the autoimmune protocol was working out really well for me, I had to go back to work and I still didn't really feel great, although I felt a lot better than I did when I was really sick. So then I had to figure out how to fit in this new eating plan with a full-time job and also managing my illness, which um, a lot of you guys know how hard it is to just be sick and have you know, your family duties, and then also work. It's, like, ridiculous. I can't imagine what it would be like if I had kids. I know a lot of you guys do. It's really a lot of work. So, um, yeah, batch cooking is something that you can do every weekend. Um, or, you know, if you don't have traditional weekends, you can just spend a weekday um, afternoon prepping food for the week. And then you always have something nutritious, delicious. You don't end up like, oh my god, I opened the fridge, there's nothing to eat, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, you just always have something on hand. So that's the idea between, behind batch cooking. And I see someone says any kind of salt you like to use. Um, I like sea salt. I know there's a lot of different kinds of sea salt. I don't have a particular brand. I tend to buy different ones and try. I haven't found one that I'm like, I only use this one, but I think, um, yeah, just avoiding the processed iodized salt is really important. Okay, what are the best bones to use for bone broth, and do you think any bones are okay? So some bones, and then this, this asker also says, are some better than others for gelatin content? The, the bone, some bones are better for gelatin, but I wouldn't discourage you from using any bones. So if you're going to go buy bones specifically to make stock and you want the most gelatin out of them, you can get chicken feet or chicken backs and necks. Those have a lot of gelatin in them. Also, beef knuckle bones have a lot of collagen and, and gelatin in them and, and connective tissue. So if you're in it just to, like, make a, some... Um, like awesome, the most nutritious broth you can make, you can start there. But I definitely don't want to discourage anyone from just using like a chicken carcass from when they roasted it last week or some leftover bones from like making chicken leg drumsticks or, you know, you can mix them up. You can use any kind you want. Um, the only bone you have to be cautious with is fish bones because they're a little bit more brittle and they don't they have, for me at least, I haven't really cooked them at high pressure very well. They really break down and they don't really gelatinize. So I have a recipe in my cookbook for salmon chowder, and I gently simmer that on a stove top, not in a pressure cooker, for an hour. So I do that a little differently. Oh, the gelatin is important because that's actually one of the most nutritious components of, um, of broth. What we do when we're eating muscle meat, we're just eating a certain part of the animal. We're not really using all of the nutritional components. And broth has a lot of different nutrition than just eating 
muscle does, and gelatin is really good for our joints, for our skin, for our hair, for connective tissue. And those are with, with autoimmune diseases. I mean, I have Hashimoto's. Um, hang on one second, something happened to my broadcast. I don't know where it went. Can you go in the left, upper left corner? Bottom, bottom left corner? Uh, bottom left. It's right here. Go to, I think it's still broadcasting. There it is. Um, sorry guys, I don't know, I don't know where it went. Here. Can you go in the left? Oh, uh, it was. I don't know what happened. I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, so, I, sorry guys, I can't, I don't know what happened to my broadcast. Um, hang on. I can't see it anymore, but I don't know where this went. Just go back to your Google. Oh, here we are. Okay, can you guys see me? Hey, Noah. Okay, good. Can someone leave me a question and say they can see me? <laughs> okay, I'm just assuming you guys can see me. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I've got all my meat patties made, and they probably don't look that great because I was talking and not looking at them. But I'm going to stick them in this 400 degree oven with the vegetables, which I'm going to pull out and stir. And I'm also going to set myself a timer for the patties. I cook them for 18 minutes at 400 degrees. I know that works for my oven to cook them perfectly. I've heard from other people that that's a little long. I think my, my oven cooks a little low, lower temperature. Um, so I set the timer for that. The root vegetables take about an hour, especially if you leave them in big chunks like I did. So I'm just going to give these a stir and stick them back in there. We've got breakfast patties, root vegetables, and this is still coming to pressure. There were some frozen bones in there, so it's taking a little while. Okay, so my next thing is going to be pate. I think it's really important to include organ meat in the autoimmune protocol, so I thought that I would include this in my demonstration today. Uh, a lot of people are not, are a little worried about eating organ meat, maybe it doesn't taste good. Um, a lot of people believe that, falsely, that the liver stores toxins, which it actually doesn't. It's a filtration organ, but it actually exports toxins to be stored in the fat. So it's actually a reason why everyone should be worried about the source of the meat that they consume because the animals store their fat in their, in, or their toxins in their fat. So the argument that not eating liver because they're worried about it storing the toxins doesn't really hold up. Um, it is important to eat grass-fed, organic, any kind of meat, I think. But liver is really important, especially beef liver, because it has lots of iron and it has um, other minerals like zinc that are otherwise hard to come by in the diet. They also have fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A and vitamin D that are notoriously hard to get in other food sources. And I personally have seen a huge benefit in, in including liver in my diet every single week. Um, and so I'm actually not a liver lover. I did not grow up eating it. I actually ate it for the first time a couple years ago when I started AIP. Um, and I just, I wasn't making progress in a couple areas. I was still anemic and I was eating a lot of red meat and it didn't really seem to be making a difference. So I started looking into eating liver every week and it did the trick, you know, and I feel really good. And page 92 in my cookbook, and it's also, this recipe is for free on my website. It's bacon, beef, liver, pate. 
So this is the way that I figured out how to make liver palatable to people that don't actually like the taste or texture of it. Um, so what I'm going to start by doing is cooking a few slices of bacon in my skillet. And I'm sure you all will have lots of questions about bacon. I think pork is totally fine. And I think that um, the thing you want to be worried about with pork is the source. So you want to be looking for a farmer that is pasturing or it's hard to find totally pastured pork because um, pigs are actually omnivores. They need meat. Um, some farmers these days will raise their pork in conjunction with um, a cow, like a dairy, and they'll use the milk solids from the dairy farm to feed their, their pigs. Um, I, pigs are, I don't think they're supposed to be completely vegetarian fed, so um, be wary. Uh, it's hard to find good pork in the grocery store. I have very rarely bought it at the store. I buy it from the farmer's market. And when you're looking for cured pork products, you're actually, it's not the sugar that we're worried about. Um, Sarah Valentine says a tiny bit of sugar in the processing isn't the end of the world, and so she said that that's AFP approved. But the thing you want to look for is nightshade spices. So um, talk to your pro farmer, processor, whoever you're buying it from. Make sure that they're raising their animals properly and that they're not putting nightshades when they're processing the pork. Um, so I put four pieces of bacon in the skillet, and I'm going to cook them until they're crispy. While um, I, cut, I cut an onion here. So we're going to cook the onion in the bacon fat, and then I'm chopping up some herbs here. And so basically I just cook the, the liver in, well first I cook the onions, then I add the, the liver and the herbs, and then we cook that all up for like 10 minutes, and then I'll set it aside until it cools a little bit, and we'll blend it up in the Vitamix, and it's actually really good. Um, Mickey, you have a question about um, incorporating organ meats, maybe some yeah. other recipes besides pate, yeah. Yeah. So kid another, friendly possibly? Kid friendly. So the best thing to do if you have kids um, is to sneak the liver. So what you're going to want to do is um, get your liver frozen or freeze it and then take it out while it's still frozen and use a big grater like this guy and grate it and while it's frozen and then put it in a plastic or like a Ziploc bag and put it back in the freezer. Anytime you have a recipe, like I just made those meat patties with ground beef, anytime you have a recipe with ground meat, add some of that liver. So you can just grab it from the freezer, it'll be already shredded up, and you can add, you know, however much you notice your kids will tolerate. You know, if you add maybe a quarter of the recipe is liver, you might be able to get away with it, but that's a really good way to sneak it in for kids. Um, and then another muscle, or another organ meat that's really palatable is actually heart. Um, it tastes a lot like muscle meat. So for your family, you might be able to sneak heart. I know um, there's actually a grocery store in Portland that I was at last week that sold lamb, ground lamb, and it was 30% heart and 10% liver just by the way they sell it. So um, ground meat is definitely a really good way to sneak stuff in. Okay. And so I'm going to prep my liver. Um, liver is pretty gross to handle, I'm not going to lie, I don't enjoy doing it, um, but I wanted to show you guys how I do it anyways because it has been a huge piece in changing my health and my personal health journey. So this is actually bison liver. Um, I like to eat red meat, liver that comes from, from red warm-blooded animals because it has a lot more iron than, say, chicken liver. Chicken liver is a lot more palatable. Um, I have a hard time finding chicken liver that's raised properly. Uh, a lot of farmers that I get chickens from will sell their chickens whole. They don't do parts. So I'm just rinsing the liver here and putting it on a... Um, Paper towel to dry. Kind of slimy, not gonna lie, not my favorite. 
And if you have someone in your family who doesn't mind handling liver, this isn't a bad time to call in a favor. Um, I will be honest and say that I usually make my husband handle the liver. And when I came to AIP, I've been vegan for 10 years, and so I was not interested. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go over here and not throw my bacon. So you have a few questions back on bone broth. Yes. The first one is, can you cook bone broth in a slow cooker? Yeah. Yeah, so you can totally cook bone broth in a slow cooker. Um, I personally haven't done it, but I have friends that do. And what they do is they do what's called a continuous broth method. And so they'll fill the, the cooker up with water and bones and bay leaf and vinegar the same way that I did the same setup. But then they'll just plug in the, the slow cooker and leave it there all the time, just on low. And so they'll take a, a cup of broth out, and then they'll add back like a broth of uh, a cup of water, whatever, to replace the liquid. And then whenever they eat bones, they'll they'll throw them in the broth. If any of the broth bones start getting crumbly or mushy or they're not good anymore, they'll pull them out. And so that's how you do it, I think, with a slow cooker. And it's really convenient because you just set it up, and then maybe every few weeks you start over. Um, but if you're comfortable having that going all the time, water. And Mickey, where do you source your bones from? Most of the bones that we use to make broth come from the meat that we eat. So very rarely do I buy bones. Um, I bought those knuckle bones at the farmer's market yesterday because I wanted to show you guys the knuckle bones because I get a lot of questions about that. But personally, I just use the leftovers from whatever I'm eating. Maybe um, we eat a lot of bone in meat. It's actually, um, I think, better to buy a meat bone in um, because then you're using all, all the parts of that animal. Um, so that's personally where we get bones. But I know you can buy them from your butcher. You can buy them Whole Foods. You can buy them from your farmer. A lot of times um, they're looking to just get rid of them for really cheap because not a lot of people are using them. So um, it's not hard to come across. Okay, so we're just waiting for this bacon to cook. Pressure cooker is at one bar of pressure here, so I'm going to start turning it down so that we don't get a loud noise. And I'm going to cook this bacon until it's pretty crispy. And I promise that bacon is the secret to making pate taste good. I, I tried pate so many different ways, and I was always choking it down until I figured out this method. Oh, and I'm going to use a too. You have a question about another type of liver. Is veal liver OK to eat, and maybe some yeah. other types of liver? Yeah. Other types of liver are totally fine to eat. Um, any like red meat animal is going to have more iron, and personally, that's what I'm really after when I eat a lot of liver because I have a tendency to become anemic. Um, you can eat, you know, chicken liver, um, veal liver, you know, lamb. We've had lamb liver. I thought it was lamb liver was a little like pungent. I thought it, it tasted a little stinky to me. So if you're like a liver aficionado, maybe you could go there. But um, bison liver is the most palatable, I think. Um, also chicken liver. But yeah, any kind of liver is good. So I'm just prepping some garlic to throw in with the pate. And my goal with this recipe was just to put in a ton of other flavors so that it doesn't only taste like liver, because I don't like how liver tastes. But I will keep telling you that I don't like it, but I eat it every single week. <laughs> um, do you guys have any other questions? Let's see, I can see these, some of these. Daily optimal fat intake. That really depends. Um, so this this asker is asking about how much fat. Um, it's really individual. A lot of people can tolerate fat, and a lot of people don't tolerate it 
extremely well, digestively speaking. I don't tolerate a ton of animal fat. I don't know if it's because I was vegetarian for so long. Um, I do take digestive support supplements, but I feel like fat digestion is something that I'm always working on. Um, and I actually, I don't feel of my best when I eat a ton of fat. So I think that's something um, people need to find out for themselves. Um, that's definitely not to say that I'm afraid of fat. I will definitely eat plenty of fat in my diet and lots of animal fat. I really do believe that fat from healthy animals is really nourishing to our bodies. And um, I noticed a big difference in my life when I started eating animal fat. Um, but I can't do all animal fat all the time. So I, eat, I do use coconut oil. I tolerate it really well. Coconut oil is a short chain fatty acid, and it actually doesn't need bile in order to be digested. So a lot of people find, um, like myself, that if they have trouble digesting fats, um, they do better with it. So I do some coconut oil. But I, I won't do any liquid oil you don't want to cook with, even olive oil. Um, they're better for cold applications. Um, so you, anytime you're cooking anything, you want to use a solid cooking fat. So I'm going to grab these slices of bacon out of here. And I'm going to throw in the onion. So I'm going to cook this onion for a few minutes, and then I'm going to add in the garlic and the herbs and the liver. Where do I get my animal fat from? So I get it from the same place I get my bones, Farmer's Market. Um, when I buy lard, um, I buy leaf lard, which I don't know. Do we have any, we don't think we have any leaf lard, but it comes in um, just kind of these big chunks of white fat, and it's unrendered, which means it's, it's straight off the animal. And so what you need to do is cut it up into bits. There's tons of tutorials online. I have a recipe in my cookbook. And so you render it down yourself. So it's just melting it and then straining it so that um, none of the, the protein and the skin or anything is on it anymore. And then that's just pure fat that you can use to cook with. So I get that at the farmer's market. And then, so this person says um, they have so much fat leftovers. Oh, um, they're unsure if you, yeah, I was just going to answer that <laughs> and the question went away. Um, but okay, so I don't know what that question was. That's the one you just answered. Um, when did I first begin to tell my anemia? Um, so I was vegan for 10 years, and I was very anemic the whole time, and I was always very tired, and I couldn't get out of bed, and I couldn't exercise very effectively. And It's a very long story, but it was kind of a part of my autoimmune disease. I have Hashimoto's. I have celiac disease. Um, both of those come with anemia as kind of a side effect of not managing yourself well. Um, and even when I was diagnosed and I knew about it and I, I knew that I needed to get iron, I was taking all kinds of supplements and they really didn't work. You know, I, I felt like I was always struggling and when I started eating liver, that was the first thing. Um, the first thing that started to change. I actually just had blood work and my, my doctor was like, I can't believe how high your iron is, like, just after how long you had suffered, and I haven't taken any supplements, I just eat liver every week, so, yeah, I would encourage you, if you have problems with iron, to really look into that. Um, what model and size do you recommend for the Kuhn Recon? Um, I have it linked in my blog post for my, um, my pressure cooker bone broth, I believe it's a Seven quart, but I'm not totally sure. But I love it. It's like the best purchase ever. And if you're going to be making broth a lot, um, which you will if you're going to invest in being on the automating protocol, before I got that, I was boiling water, boiling the broth for like a couple 
couple days. Um, so I definitely recommend it. My timer just went off for my patties. I know from experience that my patties are done. Um, after 18 minutes in the oven, I've made them so often. Oh, I'm sure this yeah, is So I took those out and then I'm going to stir these. So I'm going to let my patties cool and then once they're cool I'm going to put some in a Tupperware to use for the next few days and then I'm going to freeze the rest of them between slices of wax paper and then I'm going to um, put them in the freezer and that way you can maybe the day before take out your breakfast patty for the next morning or even the morning of or if you need a snack really on like short notice you can grab a patty and heat it up in a skillet. Um, so my onions are kind of browning along here. I like my onions to be pretty caramelized and sweet, so I'm going to let them keep cooking a little bit. These root vegetables are coming along nicely. Mickey, you have a question from Natalie about wild venison. Yeah. And if um, they're foraging for food and GMO corn and soybeans, do you have any opinion on, on wild meats? I think wild meat is awesome. You know, you don't know what they're eating, but I think it's great if you have access to it. Venison is really lean. So if you have a hunter in your family, you might want to go in on a pig with someone um, around hunting season. That's what um, my husband is interested in hunting, and that's what we plan to do is buy a pig, and then when we get the, the deer, then we'll mix it and make sausages because venison is, is just super lean and... Um, yeah, that's a really good way to do it. But yeah, I wouldn't worry about what they forage. I mean, it's it's really hard to find good animals to eat, and even the animals that we buy at the grocery store, I mean, they're all fed GMO. Um, it's really hard to tell even with organic labeling, unless you really know the farmer and you know what they're feeding it, um, it's definitely a big issue. So, yeah. Um, so, let's see. We've Still got the um, roasted root vegetables in the oven. The patties are out and cooling. The onions are coming along. I would say that those are probably ready. So now I'm going to add this garlic and herbs to it. And I'm going to add the liver, which is gross. But I do it anyways. So now I've got this pan full of liver and onions and rosemary and sage and garlic and I'm just letting it cook away. I'm not going to leave this alone too long, but usually depending on how your liver comes, mine comes pretty sliced up from um, the butcher that I get it from. Um, a farmer, and if yours isn't sliced up, you might want to remove if there's any like veins or connective tissue in there, and then um, cut it probably into like I don't know half inch thick little slices. It makes it cook a lot easier, especially when you're making pate. You don't want to overcook liver, so I'm keeping kind of an eye on it. I'll give it maybe two minutes or three minutes, and then I'll flip it over and see how it is. Um, when you push on it with like a, a spoon or something, you can kind of see when it when the pink juices come out, it's still got some, um, it's still a little rare inside. So um, 
you wanna you don't want to overcook it, but um, I think for the first time you'll see maybe take a piece out, cut it open, and see. Um, liver has a lot different texture than muscle meat. It's um, it's a little more uniform. It's not stringy. Um, definitely taste some than it needs to. I'm just going to give it a little stir here. Nikki, you have a question about batch cooking vegetables. Do you cook them completely, or do you leave them a little underdone so when you heat them up again, they're crispy? You know, um, I usually cook them all the way, and that's usually because when I when I eat them again, I eat them cold. I don't really have to have every meal be like hot and amazing and like well thought out. I will happily open the fridge and be like, oh, a little this, a little this, a little this, put on my plate and, you know, make breakfast. Um, that's a really good idea if you want to just be able to maybe slide it back in the oven with whatever's in there and, like, actually these little Pyrex Tupperwares. Um, these guys are awesome because they're oven safe and so I have a few different sizes and they're my favorite. So if you have, like, a little portioned out, you could definitely stick it back in the oven just for a That would be a really good idea. And so my liver is looking pretty good. Still has some red spots, so I'm going to let it cook a little bit longer. After my liver cooks, I'm going to let it cool a little bit, and then I'm going to add some more solid cooking fat. So I usually add coconut oil because of my um, it's more digestible to me. Um, and then I'm going to blend it in my Vitamix, and you could also use a food processor. Let's see. What do you do if you find small insects that look like aphids and cauliflower that are hard to clean out? Um, it depends on your philosophy on eating bugs. Um, I usually eat them, and I'm not scared of bugs, and I don't know. My husband's giving me a funny look. I'm scared of some bugs, but bugs on food are not the ones that scare me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, you know, on kale, I live in the Pacific Northwest. We grow kale in our backyard. There's all kinds of bugs on them, and I'll usually clean all the ones that I can find off, but um, I think if I try to clean every single one out, that's kind of, I don't know. Too crazy for me, but um, okay. So we give the liver a couple more minutes, and then I'm going to start pulling out the vegetables for the salad that I'm going to make. which I've done all this in less than an hour, which if I wasn't talking, I would probably be doing more, but this should really show you what you can get accomplished in an hour. Um, it's a lot of food. So my pressure cooker is making a little noise, so I'm just going to turn it down. And then, if you're not sure with the liver if it's done, you can slice open a little piece of it. Yeah, mine's still a little pink in the middle, so I'm going to give it a little more time. Another minute. But I am going to chop bacon into little bits, and so you can choose to either blend in the bacon with the pate when you put it in the blender or the food processor, or you can just put some crispy bacon bits on top, which I kind of like, gives it a little bit of a different texture. Mickey, do you normally eat the liver plain, or you put it on other things, or how do you eat it? 
I eat it all different ways. I will definitely eat it plain cold when I'm looking for a snack. Um, my favorite way is right after I make it on cucumber slices. Really good. Or if you have time to make plantain crackers. Um, the Paleo Mom has a really good recipe, and I have a recipe that's based off of hers that just adds herbs and um, some powdered garlic. It's really good. Um, so you can eat pate that way. How else do we eat pate? We roll it in collard green wraps a lot. Um, so we take one big leaf of collard green, and I'll put a little layer of pate in there, and then maybe um, some veggies, some carrots, cucumbers, whatever. Um, yeah, any way you eat it is the right way. And then how many recipes do you normally try and bust out during a batch cooking day? So um, this is a pretty typical batch cooking day for me. Um, I'll usually do broth and patty for like my foundation, and then I like to get a vegetable, a salad, and then if I can do something like pate or even like a pot roast, um, that's about, I'd say, my max. Um, I've done cooking for people in their kitchens professionally, so... Um, as a service, so I can kind of like, I can run through a lot of recipes, you know, if I really make a really good plan, know kind of my timing and stuff, but um, the more you batch cook, the better you're going to get at it. So I've got something in the oven, something on, two things on the stove, you know, I'm kind of talking to you guys, which I'm surprised I haven't actually burned anything yet. This pate is definitely done, but um the best days are when my husband helps me because um, with two people, so this pot is done, I'm going to take it off of the heat here. I'm going to put it on a different burner so that it can cool a little bit before sticking it in the blender. And then while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to check on these guys. Which I'm looking good, due for another stir. But yeah, if you can rope anyone in your family in, I mean, even just helping with like cleanup and keeping you company, like it's a great team activity. And I'd say those veggies need like another 15, um, maybe 20 minutes. Um, all right, so where are we at? I grabbed a zucchini instead of a cucumber. That would not be good. <laughs> All right, so I did not wash this parsley earlier, so I'm going to give it a quick rinse. And then look at how beautiful these radishes are. I love them. Okay, so in radish and jicama tabbouleh, the ingredients are simple. I'm going from memory, so I might be saying something different than what my book says. But um, lately, I make it with... Um, Parsley, radishes, jicama, um, cucumber, and like a little lemon vinaigrette. So simple. Um, the reason why I like making this salad is because it keeps really well in the fridge. So you, on a batch cooking day, you don't want to make anything with like butter lettuce or anything that's going to like wilt or not really keep. And so this, this particular salad actually keeps really well for at least three days, I think, even dressing and everything on it. Um, another salad that keeps really well is kale salad. Um, my massaged kale salad, that keeps really well with the dressing on it, too. I see. How long does pate last, and do I freeze it? I do freeze it. Um, back when I was really squeamish about handling it, I would make two batches of pate, and I would freeze one of them. Um, that's about as much as I could keep it in my or cook in my skillet at once. So um, yeah, you can definitely freeze it, and it freezes really well. Um, it keeps about a week in the fridge. Um, 
And then do I grow radishes? We didn't this year, but I have before. But yeah. So okay, I'm going to make the pate first. I'm just over here grabbing my blender. If you don't have a Vitamix or a, uh, a high power blender, I definitely recommend it. It's a tool that I actually owned before I started this whole food journey. But um, I, back in the day, I used to be a big smoothie person. Um, now I don't use it for smoothies at all. I just use it to make blended soups and things like that. Okay. Um, so I am going to transfer everything that is in my skillet into my blender. I would not try blending something like this with a regular blender. It would probably break it. I actually remember how I broke the blender before I bought this Vitamix. I put hot soup in it. It was beet soup. And it got all over my kitchen. So I'm transferring all of this nummy bacon, onion, Goodness. And then I'm going to add some coconut oil and some salt. And I'm thinking that, that wasn't enough coconut oil. So I buy coconut oil in five gallon buckets. Um, and then I have this one gallon bucket that I always keep it in here. Um, lasted us about six months, and I assume that we probably um, we probably have it for another six months. Uh, it's a lot of coconut oil. So, and then I use the tamper with the lid, so it's a lot easier to get something thick to kind of get down into the blade. It's not. So I'm just blending this on kind of on four. So it's not a very high setting, and I'm pushing it down with the camper. You want to do this not when it's like really hot, but also not when it's completely cool, because it'll blend better when it's a little bit warm. I've had this Vitamix for almost eight years now. My warranty is almost up, and I can't with all of the abuse of the pate and the coconut cream and everything, it's still going strong. And I'm not affiliated with Vitamix at all. I wish they would send me something for free, but their blender is awesome. Alright, so that looks pretty creepy. Thicker, thin, you like it. I like it pretty blended up. Um. Yeah. Sounds good. At this point, you can taste it and see um, if it's salty enough. Pretty good. I like it for sure when it's warm and freshly made. I'm 
nice big batch of liver. So like I said before, you can eat this on vegetable slices. That's kind of the easiest, um, most simple way to do it. I usually do wheat and collard green wraps. Sometimes I'll just put it on the side on a salad and eat little bites of it with my salad. Um, yeah. You can make pate in a food processor, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, I'm going to let this cool a little bit. Stick that over there. So now we're done with our pate. Broth is still going. Probably really done right now. Check on those. Okay. The veggies are done um, when you can pretty easily pierce them with a fork. So the beets and the carrots usually take a while. They're still a little hard, so I'm going to leave them for a little bit longer. And then, let's see, I'm going to show you how I freeze my patties. Oh, and I forgot about the bacon. So our bacon that we cooked with pate, I'm going to stick this on top of the pate here and then mix that in. I almost forgot. That is a yummy addition. It looks like this. Not too scary, right? You can eat that. I promise. If I can do it, you can do it. Okay. So these patties are all cool now. And I'm going to freeze them in this nice full round Tupperware thing here with um, wax paper between them because as they freeze the moisture will make them stick to each other and then once they're frozen you won't get them unstuck so it's really hard to just get one patty out. So I'm freezing most of these. Let's see if I have one more slice. So here are my patties. I'm going to put these in the freezer. And then these three I'm going to keep out in a little Tupperware um, for the next few days. I don't need to freeze them. So. And now all we gotta do is make the radish tabbouleh. Yeah, we got 20 minutes. And I thought I wouldn't even make all that stuff in, 20, in an hour and a half. I was worried. Okay. I'm gonna clean off my bacon thing. Mickey, how strong is the liver smell when it's done? It's not that. It doesn't smell like it does when it's raw. It smells uh, when it's cooking. Um, it's pretty strong, but when it's done, it, it really doesn't smell that strong, especially if you cook it in bacon. Um, so. so now I'm going to make the tabbouleh. And if you guys have any questions, this would be an awesome time to ask because I've got some chopping in front of me. I'm just going to chop up um, a bunch of parsley. If someone has an opposition to onions, can they replace that with something, maybe garlic? Yeah, you can use more garlic. Um, if it if it's for, because of FODMAPs, um, when I actually first started eating liver, I was reacting to FODMAPs, and we made it without uh, garlic or onions, and I would actually make it with some ginger. It's definitely a different taste, but it, it totally comes out. It's worth it. 
So that was my chopped parsley. This is jicama. You've never had it. You should definitely try it. It's a very refreshing um, vegetable. Tastes kind of like um, a radish. Hmm? Yeah, like an apple. My husband's like, it tastes kind of like an apple with radish. I peel it. I'm just going to put half of this one on here. Are there any more questions? Oh, someone just said that I've convinced them to try liver. <laughs> that was my goal. I hope it helps, too, seeing that I am not a fan of liver. I'm, you know, I didn't eat meat for a really long time. Eating liver was, like, the last thing that I wanted to do. But sometimes we learn to do things that really um, can change our lives, and eating liver was a big one for me. So I hope... Happy that that got across. Do you guys have any other questions? Someone wants to know more about FODMAPs. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a big question, not related to batch cooking, but some people, when they have um, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, where the bacteria that's supposed to grow in your large intestine actually grows in your small intestine and causes um, symptoms like bloating, especially right after eating. Um, and a lot of other problems and cause histamine problems. Um, I personally found that I was reactive. So um, the FODMAPs are fermentable all geosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, polysaccharides, F-O-D-M-A, and polyols, I think. Um, <laughs> I could be wrong. <laughs> And so the, those are all the components in carbohydrates that feed these bacteria. So when someone's sensitive to FODMAPs, they could be reacting to a variety, maybe all, maybe some of these components. And so a low FODMAP diet eliminates all of them. And a lot of them are very common foods. So like onions, um, jicama, which I'm chopping, is actually FODMAP um, for various reasons because they have all these components. And, um, some people need to avoid them because they can't digest them or because it brings back their, their symptoms. Is that an elimination period or will you ever um, not be yeah, sensitive? Yeah, so with SIBO, if someone has SIBO, they need to get treatment. It's not like the autoimmune protocol where someone would, would do um, like a low FODMAP diet and then they feel better and then, you know. So, I mean, some people do, but most people, they have a bacterial overgrowth and they need a doctor to treat that bacterial overgrowth. So if you find that you're reacting to these foods, what I would suggest doing is going to your doctor and saying, can I please be tested for SIBO um, and get that test and find out if you do have it because even if a low FODMAP diet helps, um, it's not really something that's been shown by itself to make um, SIBO go away. So you do need treatment. Okay, so I've got the jicama and the parsley in here. And now I'm going to do some radishes, which are so pretty. Nikki, on the autoimmune protocol, what did you find was the hardest diet change, aside from maybe organ meat? Eating meat in general was, like, seriously not what I wanted to do. <laughs> it was horrible. So um, I felt like once I overcame the idea that my body needed meat, I could come, overcome any kind of idea about food because, you know, I had a lot of physical issues, energy issues. Um, I couldn't stand for very long, so it was hard for me to cook for myself. But um, none of those were really as bad as just in general. Um, getting to a place where I could eat meat and really – not feel terribly guilty and, I don't know, just upset about that. I'm still a little bit, um, it's hard for me, you know. Um, it's definitely hard, but I do my best to source animals 
that you know have been cared for well. Um, we're now in the process of learning how to raise our own animals. And like that ethical piece, I know personally I take it a little farther than some people do just because I have a history of vegetarianism and um, being a big animal lover and, you know, it's hard. Do you have any other helpful hints for the freezer, um, especially people with low volume freezers? Hmm. Yeah, it's hard because, you know, you either want to be storing a bulk meat buy or you want to be storing, like, bulk food for prepping ahead. Um, so what I would do is there are actually some meat CSAs. We have one in Seattle. Um, Crown S Ranch will let you order, I think, like an eighth of a cow, and then they'll deliver every month to a cooler in the neighborhood. So you I would go on Eat Wild and see if there's a, a farm near you that does something like that. Um, that's a really cool option for people that don't have a lot of freezer space but also want to get in on a, on a bulk buy um, because that's the, definitely the cheapest way to get clean meat. Um, another thing would be, you know, make bone broth often enough to where you don't have to freeze it. Like people talk all the time about making broth and freezing it and I never freeze it anymore because I don't use it from the freezer. I use it fresh and I make it once a week now and it's part of my routine and I just have it fresh in my fridge. Um, so, you know, if you're sourcing your meat, maybe through a CSA, um, making bone broth fresh and not really having that in the freezer, I'd say then the only other thing you need for your freezer is, you know, making meat patties. You could make um, a lot of soups and stews freeze really well in portion size containers. Um, I have a, a recipe for magic chili on my website. Um, for people that don't like beets, I have carrot and sweet potato chili, and those two just are really easy to make. They um, you can double them really easily. If you have a huge soup pot, like you can um, have a restaurant supply near you. This thing, I mean, how cool is this? You make a ton of super stew and then freeze it. It's awesome. So. Um, yeah, even with um, from not having a, a deep freezer or an additional freezer, you can definitely make that work with some of those tips. And you have a request for another session, maybe doing uh, your basics that you like to keep on hand, dressings and sauces yeah. and coconut. Yeah, and actually, how much time do we have left? Yeah, we only have 10 minutes left. so. Actually, at this point, um, I, if you guys find this helpful and you really like it, leave me a comment somewhere and tell me because uh, I'm totally open to doing more of this, um, especially since I get all my batch cooking done and I feel like I've helped the community at the same time, which is like a win, -win. Um, So yeah, I could definitely show you how to do some, some dressings. Um, I was going to try to do garlic mayo today, which I can just walk you, walk you through. Um, I have uh, coconut cream sitting on my oven, because you remember from earlier, my oven is very warm, it's not insulated very well, um, so whenever I want to melt something down, I stick on there. So I have my melted down coconut cream, and so I would make garlic mayo in my Vitamix, and I just put this coconut cream with some raw cloves of garlic, some um, olive oil, some salt, um, little lemon juice and that is a really great meal replacement and the raw garlic really makes it not taste like coconut. So that's one of my favorite things to make. Um, and I wanted to give away a book to all of you guys that um, stuck around until um, the end you have an opportunity to win. So the first person to email me at autoimmunepaleo, all one word, at gmail.com with the secret password, Savannah, the first person gets a, to win a signed book from me. So go for it right now. And then for those of you who aren't emailing Mickey, <laughs> how do you reheat the um, beef patties? Good question. Okay, so the the best way to reheat the patties, I think, um, if you can keep pull one out the night before for breakfast, so if you're going to eat one for breakfast tomorrow, just pull it from the fridge and put it, or from the freezer and put it in the fridge, 
Then in the morning, it won't be totally solidly frozen. It'll probably be a little frozen. I like to reheat them in a skillet on very low heat, but you need to do it kind of delicately because if you do it too hot, then it'll burn on the outside or get more overcooked on the outside, and the inside will still be cold and it doesn't taste good. So um, the lower, slower reheat method you can do, the better. You could stick it in, in a low oven while other things are heated or warming up. Um, another way is to use a microwave. I personally don't use a microwave, not because of any um, science reason. Actually, Sarah Ballantyne is a really good friend of mine. Um, told me all about why microwaves are actually not that bad, and there's nothing really from a health standpoint. There have never been any studies. Um, I don't like them because they don't cook food very well, and it's just kind of another appliance, and I like you know, having counter space for other things. So if you choose to use a microwave, you know, I have no problem with that. Um, and yeah, skillet is the way I do it. Okay. Uh, I'm so happy I got a few messages from you guys saying that this is really helpful. I've got um, seven more minutes. I should probably take those root vegetables out. So I should probably do a little recap. So in an hour and a half, we made, we started our bone broth. We made um, meat patties, which for those of you here, I've got these all frozen for the week. So I've got breakfasts for me for a week. I've got vegetables for a side dish. I've got my bone broth that will be done in a couple of hours, and all it needs to do is be strained and put into um, mason jars and put in the fridge. Um, I'm mostly done with the radish and jicama tabbouleh, but I think you guys know how to chop vegetables. Just recipes on my site and then my... Um, so I've got a little side salad that will keep for a few days in the fridge. And then I also have pate, which is really important for the immune protocol so that you can increase nutrient density. Um, and if I haven't said it a many times, you should eat with the organ mix. Um, and then if you guys have any more questions, um, I have a few more minutes while I'm chopping the rest of this tabbouleh, so ask away. Um, oh, and the winners. The winner is Kari Owens. So Kari, if you want to um, send me your address, I will sign a book for you and send it tomorrow. Thank you for uh, entering my giveaway. Okay. I've got a bunch of questions. Okay. What containers do you use to freeze big batches of your chili? So um, glass does not work. Um, I always like glass containers because you just avoid the BPA or even, I, I personally think that there's other things in plastics to worry about than BPA, so even things that are BPA free, um, I'm not totally comfortable putting food in them, especially warm food. Freezing is really difficult because when you freeze a lot of um, liquid in a glass jar, it expands and breaks it. So I will use BPA free plastic for freezing. I haven't found a better or a different solution. Um, I don't usually freeze in large quantities um, at once, but what I'll do is put things in portion size containers and then freeze those. And I make sure that the food is completely cooled um, because then I think it minimizes the possibility that something's going to leach out of plastic. Um, so I will show you a couple. You know, like I have these EPA free Tupperwares. You know, I'll do like a soup here, a soup there. Um, yeah. Let's go down. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, I got no more questions, so I guess I'll wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me in my kitchen for an hour and a half. We got a lot done, and I hope that this inspired you and showed you that you can do this. Um, it's not that hard. You just got to kind of start doing it and see what recipes you like, what things make you feel prepared during the week. Um, and uh, yeah, you have all the tools. You got all the recipes. Um, actually, in, a, in the next couple weeks, I will be giving away two weeks of free um, free meal plans and shopping lists and all of the recipes that are on the meal plans shopping list will be free on my website so everything's totally free if you don't have my book 
um, you have no excuse to get started. So, um, yeah, that's it for today, and thanks for joining me. Have a good day.